It is impossible to have a home improvements month without looking at this passage of scripture. It's probably the maybe the greatest one in all the Bible doctrinally on the home and roles. And uh, this evening I want to speak on the subject of rules of the roles. The rules of the roles. We've all heard the old saying, the rules of the road. I don't know about you, but I thank the Lord there's rules of the road. Um, If you can imagine what it would be like if we did not have any. None of us would ride on the roads if they took out all the stop signs and all the signal lights and all the yield signs and erased the white lines on the right and the yellow lines in the middle. And and, uh, they just said to people, there's no speed limits. And you can drive any way, anywhere you want. And took all the guardrails off all the bridges. Um, I don't think we drive. It is the rules that give us security. And um, rules are not bad things. Uh, our Lord said, he that keepeth my sayings, he it is that loveth me. If you love me, keep my commandments. And uh, there are rules of the rolls, as there are rules of the road. And so why should we think that marriage is different? Uh, God is a God of structure. God is a God of order. Uh, He is a God who has said to us, let all things be done decently and in order. Uh, when God gets into our life, he starts putting things in order. He starts putting our mind back in order. And uh, oftentimes, one of the residual effects of getting saved is he starts putting people's finances in order. And uh, their time management in order. And uh, they, they begin to do better with their time. Another thing is our relationships uh, in order. There's, a, there's an order to the church. Uh, It's not chaotic. God is the author of peace, as in all churches of the saints. And um, so he gives us doctrinal passages like this to study so we know what our roles are. And I want to share three of them uh, with you this evening that are roles for our homes and what the rules of the roles are. So just like all the rules that we have on the streets give us security and confidence to drive on those streets. Uh, The same thing when we are conforming to the rules of the home. Uh, It will give us security in our home. And we must remember God is the uh, originator and institutor of marriage and the family. The family is an institution of God. and Of course, he has all the right in the world to tell us how to run it. And we need to uh, yield to what he has to say. God always starts, in in almost every case without exception, God always starts his instruction with the women and tells them what to do. Uh, In Genesis 3 and verse 16, the Lord said this, And unto the woman he said, In verse 17 he says, And unto Adam he said, And he almost always starts with the woman in telling her uh, what to do and what her role would be. In Colossians chapter 3 and uh, verse 18, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. Verse 19, Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. When the Lord was writing the first pastoral epistle and setting in order the behavior of the church, before he ever addressed the men, he addressed the women. And in 1 Timothy 2, in verse 9, he says this, In like manner also that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearl or costly array, but with good works. Let the women learn and subject silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man. 
but to be in silence, for Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression, notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing, if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. Notice, as Paul is instructing Timothy, the pastor, the young pastor on behavior in the church, he begins with the women. And the first thing he says is they ought to dress in modest apparel, and they ought not to be only modest outwardly, but then he says with shame, facedness, and sobriety, they ought to be modest inwardly. That's the first thing he talks about. First thing God ever did in the garden was what? Put clothes on them. First thing he dealt with was modesty. It's very important. The phrase modest apparel means long flowing garments. Long flowing garments. That's what it means. And then we're supposed to be modest inwardly. And then he goes on and he talks about learning in silence with all subjection, suffering not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority. And then in the next chapter, he goes on to the men. He says, this is the true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. And then he gives... Uh, standard after standard after standard of what the bishop should be. Bishop must be blameless. The husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. Then he goes on to the deacons, and he says more things. I'm skipping a lot of it for uh, time. When you get to the book of Titus, he says in chapter number 2, verse 4, he says that they teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. And then after he addresses the young women, he says, young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded. In all things showing thyself a pattern of good works, in doctrine showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech, etc. We see that in Titus. When we see the text in Peter, 1 Peter chapter 3, he begins with the women. In verse 1, likewise ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, and gives them instructions through verse 6. Then verse 7, he says, likewise ye husbands, dwell with them uh, according to uh, knowledge, giving honor unto them as the weaker vessel, and being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. And notice in our text tonight, Ephesians chapter number 5, he begins with the women. He says in verse number 22, about the home, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. And then he goes on to the men, verse 25, husbands, love your wives. And so we see this pattern. We see over and over and over again this pattern of addressing the wives and the women and their behavior first, and then the husbands and the men and their behavior uh, after that. And so I want to give you three rules tonight of the roles that we need to embrace and practice in our homes if we're going to have good, peaceful, godly Christian homes the way God would ordain it. Number one, the wives' role is submission. Number one, the wives' role is submission. Now, that's a scary word to some people today because they picture um, a bunch of male chauvinist pigs uh, in Neanderthal, uh, you know, leather girdles with a club in one hand and his wife's hair in the other hand, and he's dragging her along the street like the old cartoons uh, used to have. And that's like the first picture that some women have when they hear that word submission and they get really nervous about that and um, uh, we need to set that aside and realize the word submission is actually a, a military term uh, many of you men some of you ladies were in the military and you know they, they taught us what our role was first as foot soldiers as privates before we ever met the brass uh, before we ever saw a general or a colonel or lieutenant colonel or major or anywhere else down, captains, lieutenants, they took us 
and they made a unit, and they, they got us to be submissive first. They drilled us. They marched us. They taught us drill and ceremony and military customs and law and, and how to use your weapons and so on and so forth. And, and they told us what our job was first, what our business, what, our, what, what was required of us first. They didn't take us aside and say, no, these are the generals and the colonels and so on and so forth, and this is what their responsibility is. No, they had to teach those that were in submission what was expected of them first for the unit uh, to work well because the, the brass knew what to do. And so they worked on us first. All of us have been in submission all of our lives. We have to be for things to work. Uh, we're all in submission to the local police department. We're in submission to the local judges. We're in submission to local government. We're in submission to uh, state government. We're in submission to federal government. Uh, I'm in submission to the president of the United States, to the governor of New York, and to the mayor in my town, and so on and so forth. That doesn't make them any more human than me. Uh, we're equal in God's eyes when it comes to our humanity. But they just have a higher role than I have. And uh, we're in submission in the church to the pastor. That doesn't make him any better than us. Uh, that, that doesn't make him any more human than us. It's just that all of everything in the world teaches us that somebody needs to be in charge. And somebody else needs to be in submission. We could look at so many examples tonight. We know that we, we, we have to have one president. Whether you like him or not, doesn't matter. You've got to have one president. What would happen to our nation if we had two presidents? The whole thing would, would, would become chaotic. Uh, what would happen to a church if it had two pastors? What would happen to an orchestra if it had two conductors? Uh, and one decided to go like this and one decided to go like this. What would happen? What would happen to a band if you had two conductors? What would happen to a school if you had two principals? What would happen to a classroom at school or college if you had two teachers? What would happen to a football team if you had more than one head coach? Now he's got assistants under him, but you've got to have one head coach, a volleyball team, softball team, soccer team, or whatever. What would happen to a company, no matter how big it is, it's got to have one CEO and president, uh, whether it's Walmart or Kohl's or uh, Target or whatever, or Jubilee or Tops. There's got to be one person. Everything in society tells us that's what works. Now, none of those people in leadership are perfect. Every one of them makes mistakes, and everybody underneath them pays for the mistakes they make in their judgments uh, and the decisions, and uh, sometimes people underneath them suffer. Um, yeah, it's just my opinion, but it, it seems like many in America are suffering uh, tonight because of some of the decisions that our leader is making in this country. Many have lost their jobs, and aren't even looking for jobs anymore, and the unemployment rate's high, and so on and so forth, but we, we still got to have one president. Got to have one president. It, it's the only thing that works. And um, there's an old saying, anything with two heads is a monster. Anything with two heads is a monster. Imagine a human being walking around with two heads. We'd, we'd all be screaming and shrieking and diving under chairs and running out of doors and so on. That would be a monster. And we know this is true from society, and you can carry this thought on and on and on and on and on to, to, to anything. I don't care if you have a business with uh, seven employees, I think Mark told me he has or something. Somebody's got to be in charge at his business. Somebody's got to be in charge. You can't have two people in charge. It doesn't work. But then when it comes to marriage, somehow people think there's going to be dual leadership or something, when, when all of everything in our society says that doesn't work, we try to have it work in a marriage. 
doesn't work. There has to be one head. And so we are told here in verse 24, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church and he is the savior of the body. So the husband is the head of the wife and the wife's role is to be in submission to her own husband. Now again, don't, don't get these warped definitions of submission going around in your head that were perhaps implanted there by the feministic movement which has taken such a strong uh, hold on American thought today. Uh, don't. Just, just look at submission as something that, that we, we have to do uh, for things to work. It has to be that way. Somebody has to be the leader and somebody has to be the follower. I always tell people the husband is like the king of the house. The wife is like the queen. She's not some peasant servant lady that's hired to clean up your messes and so on and so forth. She's not a peasant. She's the queen. She's the queen, but the husband is the one that is in uh, the headship. The body, it says, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. And uh, therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own uh, husbands. And so the human body then becomes a visual aid for us to understand how leadership works. There's got to be one head and there's got to be one body. God has so created our bodies so that from our head, you know, everything from the neck down exists to serve the head. Think about that. Everything from the neck down exists to serve the head. What the head wants to do sends a message to the body and the body obeys. God has so designed us, our anatomy, so that the brain, from the brain, there goes 31 different pairs of large nerves into the body, which then break off into smaller nerve endings, and they take messages from the brain to every single cell, every single tissue, and every single organ in the body gets the message from the head. Fascinating how God made that. But they are in pairs because the messages that go down, the other set of the pair sends a message from the body to the head. It is not one-way communication. It is two-way communication. And uh, one of the things, some of you maybe go to chiropractors, and the, the philosophy of, of chiropractic is that these 31 nerves uh, pairs go down your backbone and then to every single cell, every single tissue, every single organ of your body. And if one of them gets pinched by a subluxation, a bone or something pinches it, then some organ uh, is, is not going to get the message from the brain uh, to function properly. And it may cause some kind of effects. For me, it was sinus problems horrific sinus problems that caused me to sneeze and they told me it was allergies and they put me on every kind of drug imaginable and then I tried vitamins and then I tried herbs and then I tried diet and so on and nothing worked until I went to a chiropractor. A couple of visits fixed that and it's been fixed ever since. And I don't have the sinus problems that I once had. My kids are here, my wife, they can tell, me, tell you what kind of sinus problems I used to have. And that was all fixed because of a pinched nerve that was not sending signals to a particular organ to do whatever it did, but it did it. And so the husband is pictured by the head. He sends messages to the body, but he also receives messages back from the body about a particular need. And there's this two-way communication going on, but there's still one head. And so the body from the neck down is in submission to the head. And what's the result of that? We function pretty well. 
we function pretty well. Aren't you glad your body just doesn't start doing whatever it wants to? You know, your head says right now it's time to sit down in church and listen to the sermon. And your body is in subjection to that. Later on, your, your head says it's time to go out to our cars and go home. And so your feet start going out to your car so you can accomplish what the head wants. The head gets a signal, you know, I'm getting a signal from the stomach. We're hungry. It's time to eat. And so this is the visual aid God uses of how the church should function. The pastor is not the head of the church. Christ is the head of the church. And the entire church, the body, is supposed to take its marching orders from the head. And so the body is in submission. So submission isn't a bad thing. It's a very important thing to accomplish something. And if your family is going to accomplish something, the role of the wife must be that of submission to her husband. Even though he is not perfect, even though he's going to make mistakes, and even though you're going to suffer for some of the decisions that he makes, God has so ordained that he be the head of the wife. <clears throat> I know I made mistakes as the head of my family with some of the decisions, and as a result, my wife suffered my kids uh, had to suffer sometimes because of a decision I made or something that wasn't right. But for the most part, I made the right decisions with God's help so that they were blessed and they were in submission. I mean, man, just think of these military leaders who maybe made a mistake in combat and hundreds of men die. They have to live with that. Sometimes pastors make mistakes it's in the church suffers but submission we know is the only thing that works there's got to be one head of any organization and your home is an organization there's got to be a head and God has so chosen the husband now there's all kinds of theories flying around on why that is and and um, I, th I think the best one is just simply because the uh, the Bible says the woman is the weaker vessel. She's weaker physically, and many would argue she's weaker emotionally and maybe more prone to make emotional decisions than analytical decisions. It ever dawned on you that almost 100% of everything you've ever seen invented was invented by a man? You think that one through. I don't care, light bulbs, screws, chains, lights, whatever, fixtures, buildings. Not that women can't be in construction, but when it comes to inventing things, almost everything ever made was invented by a man. Why? Because the man is the image and the glory of God. That's why. And he's creative, and he's analytical, and he thinks things through often by setting his emotions aside. Emotions can be very dangerous things. And it's not very smart to follow emotions. We got a lot of people hooting and hollering. They're so excited because for the first time ever, we got 78 women in the House of Representatives down in Washington and 20 women in the Senate, more women than ever. And where's the popularity rating of the Congress today? It's at its lowest point ever. And you know what the big problem is down there? They're making emotional decisions. They're making emotional decisions. These kids got shot, so we got to take guns away from all the good law-abiding citizens. That's just emotions. It's emotions. These people love each other. Why shouldn't they have a right to get married? They love each other. It's all emotions. I'm not saying we shouldn't have women in government. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying I, I think it's a, that's an illustration. It's an illustration, and we need emotions. We need men who have emotions and feel for their wives and feel for their children, but we, we need those emotions, those special emotions that a woman has towards her children and towards her husband to make the world go round. 
But the wife's role is submission. And that doesn't mean she's a slave. Again, that, she's sending messages to her husband all the time, and he's receiving them, and he's responding to them in a leadership role. Any man who's got any sense in his head knows and identifies that his wife is, has got some areas of expertise in her that she, he doesn't have. And just like a football coach may have a running back coach underneath him in submission to him, but that guy might know more about running backs than the head coach does. Any wise head coach would say, well, why don't you run that area? We'll do better if you just oversee that area right there. And he puts him in charge. And so it is in our homes. We see the value of our wives and her talents, and, and we use them. We say, well, you know, why don't, why don't you do that? This is the hard one. Number two, the role of the husband is sacrifice. The role of the wife is submission. The role of the husband is sacrifice. Ephesians 5. And by the way, you notice God gives the wife three verses of instruction. God gives the husband nine verses. And there is more instruction in the Bible to men than there is to women. I mean, you read that book of Proverbs. I know a lot of Proverbs deals with all of us, but you read the book of Proverbs, and the first 30 chapters is my son, my son, my son, my son, my son, my son, 23 times. Then you get to the last chapter, who can find a virtuous woman for her? And then there's instructions for her. There's more instructions in men. We have got to understand, and, and, and by the way, ladies, if this will help you, you're going to be glad you're not a man on the judgment day. Let me say that again. You ladies, you're going to be glad you're not a man on the judgment day. God's going to send the men up to give account for their family, to give account for their marriage, to give account for their churches, to give account for their countries, to give account for their cities. He's going to, he's going to send the men up. And there's going to be an accounting of our stewardship. And man, we need to embrace this. We cannot shirk our responsibilities. We have got to embrace our roles. And God wants us to be the leaders, and leaders, by leaders, he means sacrificial leaders. Notice verse number 25, you know, as far as I'm concerned, when it comes to commandments, this is about the hardest one in the Bible. Verse 25, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Now, if it stopped right there, that would be awful hard. You, you don't have a chance doing this unless God's Holy Spirit is all over you. But there's eight more verses after it. Husbands, love your wives. And notice, notice what I'm saying here. Number two, the role of the husband is sacrifice. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. That's sacrifice. Jesus loved the church. The church was his wife. I should say the church is his wife. He's gone to prepare a place for us. And if he's gone to prepare a place for us, he will come again and receive us unto himself, that where he is, there we may be also. And the first thing after he receives us in heaven for us is what? The marriage supper of the Lamb. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. We're going to be joined to our husband physically in the new Jerusalem, the church is a type of a wife, and Christ is a type of the husband, verse 25. And notice what the role is, sacrifice. Christ, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church, and here it is, gave himself for it, sacrifice. That's our role, to sacrifice ourselves for our wives. As we talked about this morning, 
about charity, uh, that unconditional love, the unconditional giving of ourselves, expecting nothing in return. And this is how husbands sh should be. I believe by far the husband's role is much harder than that which is given to the wife, much harder. For God is expecting him to sacrifice everything. In verse 23, we saw, for the husband is the head of, uh, is the, head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. You know, not only is something with two heads a monster, but a head without a heart is a monster. A head without a heart is a monster. Did you know that literally in the Bible, in the Greek, the heart is the core of the mind? It's actually located above the neck. We always point right here because that's where our physical heart, the pump is. But actually, car, cardia refers to the core of the mind, the very innermost recesses of a man's thinking is where the heart is. And a head without a heart is also a monster. And so in our role as husbands, we are to be sacrificial, and we are to have a heart. And it takes a heart to be sacrificial. Love your wives. Notice verse 28, love their wives, loveth his wife. Verse 33, love his wife. Four times we see the word love and it's the Greek word agapao from agape which is the equivalent of God's love. It doesn't just say here be fond of your wife. Do you know when it tells a wife to love her husband, it's only one time in Titus, you know the word love means fondness? She's supposed to be fond of her husband, but the husband's supposed to love his wife with a divine love. It's the superior Greek word. For the wife, it's the inferior Greek word for love. The man is to sacrifice, he is to have a heart, his love is to be the superior love in the relationship. He looks at his wife and he says, I, I love her. I'm going to just sacrifice myself for her the rest of my life. Why? Verse 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he may present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot nor wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and Without blemish, I want you to notice here, men, as we try to embrace our, our, the rules for our roles tonight, not only sacrifice, but listen, your wife being related to you should be made better by you. That's what it says, verse 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it, the church, with the washing of water by the word that he might present it to himself, a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Husbands, this is tough stuff right here. But basically what it's saying here is that our wives should improve because they are related to us. I like the story Dr. Alan Griffith taught at the marriage conference last week, and I don't have it down exactly, but... There was something about this couple came to him for counseling and they were so at odds with each other, so fighting with each other that they actually came in two different cars, came to the office and sat in different seats, wouldn't even talk to each other. And he began to address the husband to see what the problem was and the husband just blamed his wife and they'd been married for eight years. And, and uh, she's no good. And he was just all over his wife saying horrible things about his wife. Some of you remember the story probably better than I do. And uh, so the, the, the man just railed on his wife, just railed on his wife. And so finally, Brother Griffith asked the man, he said, now, would you say she's better today than she was when you first married her or worse? And the man said, oh, she's far worse. And he said, well, then the problem has been your leadership because under eight years, she should have gotten better and better, and better, and better, and better. But what have you just admitted? You've just admitted that eight years under your leadership, all she's done is gotten worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. And that kind of silenced the poor fella. 
But that's the way it is. That's the way it is. My wife should become a better person because she married me. She should become more spiritual because she married me, that he might sanctify, that means be made holy, and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. I, I tell men when you get married, your first responsibility to her is to, her being related to you should, should help her become more spiritual. You should be the man of prayer. You should be the man of the word. You should be the spiritual leader of the family, and as a result, she should become more spiritual because she married you. Verse 28, So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself, for no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. Notice the husband is to nourish and to cherish. Nourish is a reference to taking care of her physically. Cherish is a reference to taking care of her emotionally. And so we're supposed to be helping her spiritually. We're supposed to be helping her physically. We're supposed to be helping her emotionally. All of that should improve because they married us. And so the role of the husband is that of sacrifice. He gives everything. He, he looks at his wife as a gift that God has given him. He looks at himself as a steward of her. He looks at marriage as a ministry. He doesn't look at his wife as a commodity, but he rather looks at marriage as a ministry and says, I, I'm going to give an account someday of the stewardship, of my stewardship of this precious wife God gave me. And he tries before he dies to make her more spiritual, to take care of her physical needs, to take care of her emotional needs, to take care of her material needs, and take care of her physical needs. That's what he does. That's quite an order. Any of you young men that are here tonight who are selfish, please don't get married. Please don't think about it. If these are not your motives for marriage, don't get married. Please don't. You have no right to wreck a woman's life. You have no right to make her worse because she married you. These ought to be your goals. I honestly want to present my wife at the judgment someday and say, Lord, you gave her to me. I was a good steward of her. And, and, and I, I used my marriage as a ministry. As I've said before, I can get another church. I can't get another wife. And I want to minister to her, and I, I want that phrase, heirs together of the grace of life. I want that phrase to be what described the marriage of Art and Leslie Cole. Heirs together of the grace of life. And I want her to benefit every way a woman can benefit because she married me. Because she married me. And so I have to obey the Lord and have the power of the Holy Ghost in that obedience of the rules of these roles that he has for me. It says, no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it. And we're one flesh, just like those two pieces of duct tape we looked at, pressed together. They're one. They're no longer two. They're one flesh. Number three, the role of children is obedience. The role of children in the home is obedience. In chapter 6 and verse 1, it says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. And it's so wonderful if you have parents. I know a lot don't. And we're going to get to some pretty interesting sermons next time in messages 7 and 8 uh, about what to do. But that word parents comes from pair. There's supposed to be two of them. That's how it's supposed to be. And you're supposed to obey both. You're not supposed to try to pit the one against the other. You're supposed to obey your mother and father. Why? For this is right. Obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Now, what if, you know, the questions come up, what if they want me to do something illegal or immoral or unseemly? Well, then you obey God. Same thing with a wife. You know, she's to obey her husband, but if he wants her to do something illegal or immoral or unseemly, then... She's to obey God. There is one authority higher than her husband in her life, and that is God. And, uh, man, that prison over in Albion is full of women 
uh, whose husbands wanted them to sell drugs, forge checks, and the, the dear lady did it, take this package to so-and-so, and she found out she was delivering drugs, and she got arrested for it. We're not talking about that. It's supposed to be in the Lord. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. That's your duty. That's all you got to do right now at this season in your life. You're going to be out from under them eventually by the calling of marriage or by the calling of ministry, maybe military, something like that, service. You're going to be out from underneath your parents, but until then, obey your parents in the Lord. For this is right. Honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. God promises longevity to children who obey and honor. It's possible to obey without honoring, right? To honor means to hold up in high esteem and respect. As I've illustrated before, you can, your parents can say, uh, you know, take out the garbage. And you can grab the garbage cans like this and, I always got to do this. What do they think I am, their slave? Is the kid obeying their parents? Yeah, taking out the garbage. Are they honoring their parents? No, they're embarrassing their parents. The opposite of honor is embarrass. Anything you do that embarrasses your mom and dad, you're violating the fifth commandment. Honor thy father and mother that thy days may be long. That's repeated in the New Testament. There's commandments all over the New Testament, over 200 of them. And they're given to us as rules to live by. And you say, well, I, I can't do that, but God can help you. That's why the Holy Spirit was given to us, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And so you can obey your parents. You can honor your father and mother, even if they're not saved. Even if they're not doing everything right, you can still obey them and honoring, honor them. And Jeremiah said it's a good thing for youth to bear the yoke, to bear the yoke in your youth. And man, if you, if you live 80 years, usually you're out from underneath that yoke after 20 so for one quarter of your life, you're under the yoke of youth, and then the next three quarters, you're, you're free. But you still ought to honor your parents, take care of them, and do all those other things the Bible says. But that's your role. And children, God reigns in the affairs of everybody's life, and God blesses or curses as he watches us and our attitude and our spirit towards our parents. So obey your parents and honor them. It'll come to pass. It'll come to pass, and you'll be out of the home and, and into your, uh, your life or your commitment in marriage or ministry or however God leads you. But till then, that's your roles. And these roles bring security and peace to the home when the wife's role is that of submission the husband's role is that of sacrifice. You know, wouldn't you agree with me that if somebody was really sacrificing for you, it'd be pretty easy to submit to them? Don't you think so? And I think every husband can make it really easy on his wife if you just sacrifice for your wife. Just everything you do is, is for her. Uh, it's, your, it's your ministry. It, it's, it's one of your foremost ministries in your life is to minister to your wife, sacrifice for her. And as she sees that, she's not going to have any problem being in submission. And parents and children won't have much problem either obeying and honoring. These are the rules of the roles for us to improve our homes. And I don't know where you're at, what you're struggling with. Uh, I know pride is a horrible thing. Uh, that can keep us from embracing what God wants and make us fight against it and buck against it and so on. And, 
But if we could yield and submit, yield and submit to the Lord's word tonight, uh, our homes will have order and peace. Let's bow for prayer. Heavenly Father, help us. I pray every young lady here would not marry a young man until she can say in her heart, I can be in submission to him. And I pray not one young man or unmarried man would marry a wife until he can say, I just want to sacrifice for her the rest of my life. Everything I do, I just want to be for her and the kids and for the Lord. I just want to live that life of charity, sacrifice, expecting nothing in return. And I pray for the children that are here. I know some of their homes aren't in all the order you'd have them to be, but there's never been perfect parents, Lord. Not a one. And that's their duty at this season in their life is to obey and honor. I pray they'd do it so their lives would be long, so you reign in the affairs of their life so they could live a long life with the blessing of God on it. Help them to watch their attitude towards their moms and dads and somehow love them and pray for them and be obedient and just, just be good kids. Lord, help us with all this, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's turn to page 160.